I want to continue on from this morning's message, uh, which I entitled, The Wisdom from Above. The Wisdom from Above. We are to be conformed into the image of Christ. We are to be conformed into uh, what he has to say in uh, this verse. And so uh, we have our own wisdom, but that's not what we need. We need the wisdom that is from above. And so we saw the first thing that God's wisdom is, is that it's going to make us pure and then peaceable. And so uh, I want to continue on and um, hit the next point, gentle. God's uh, wisdom will make us gentle, uh, gentle men and gentle women. Uh, let me read you this quote. The effect of true religion is to make everyone, in a proper and best sense of the term, a gentleman. How can a man evidence that he is a true Christian who is not such? The highest title which we can give to a man is that he is a Christian gentleman. And uh, I think especially with men, uh, they don't realize how important it is to be gentle. Uh, God expects us to be gentle with everybody. Uh, as they say, uh, life is fragile, handle with prayer. You know, we, we've got to be gentle with one another. Uh, let me read you another quote. There is no truer mark of a real Christian than a quiet and gentle, gentle spirit. It was possessed by him who made us, under, who is made unto us wisdom, for when he was reviled, he reviled not again. To be like Christ, we must be meek and gentle. I want to be Christ-like, amen? And so if I want to be Christ-like, I must be gentle. I, I must speak kindness. Um, I want to be Christ's servant. So what does God say that the Christ's servant is like? Look at Second Timothy 2 and verse 24. <clears throat> And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. The servant of the Lord must be gentle unto who? All men. All men. And uh, Titus says, says basically something similar. Uh, look at Titus chapter 3. Just <clears throat> Timothy, the next book is Titus. <coughs> Titus chapter 3 verse 9 but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law for the unprofitable and vain you know people are so willing to uh, to argue about things we don't need to. Let's just be gentle one with another. Doesn't mean we don't stand for the truth because the very next verse says a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. <clears throat> so, an admonition. What's an admonition? A verbal kind of rebuke saying, look, you're going the wrong way. So, Gentle doesn't mean we don't stand for the truth. Gentle doesn't mean we don't stand for God and stand against sin. But it means that we do it in a kind way. <clears throat> Gentleness is not weakness. It's actually weak people that have to, to uh, uh, get angry and yell at people. Because they're not comfortable in, <clears throat> in themselves or in what they're saying. Now, let me read you this quote. Some assume that they are strong in argument only if they are violent in argument. <clears throat> he, who has he who has established a sincere conviction of the truth in his heart and possesses a genuine faith in the ultimate triumph of right will disdain such efforts and will be content to speak the truth in love. You see, that's what we're supposed to do. Speak the truth in love. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 15. 
but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And uh, God wants us to speak the truth in love. God wants us to be gentle. And uh, I know a few Christian men that, uh, you know, they're, they're gruff and, and, and they're not nice. And they don't realize <clears throat> that God expects you to be gentle to who? What did it say? Remember? Anybody? Oh. All men. My wife, my husband, my children, my friends, my, my co-workers, uh, everybody. So what about if they're not gentle to me? I'm the Christian, amen? I'm the one that <clears throat> has the Lord Jesus Christ in them. I am to be gentle. Okay, so let's go on. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. So, easy to be entreated. What, what's that mean, easy to be entreated? Well, entreat means to supplicate successfully. To prevail upon by prayer or solicitation. To persuade. persuade. So, it's easily persuaded into the truth. Um, good illustration of that is, let's go to... Uh, uh, <clears throat> Luke 15. Luke 15. What's, what is Luke 15 about? Well, the main thing in Luke 15. The story of the prodigal son. And... <clears throat> When he comes back in repentance, the father is excited, but the older brother is angry. And uh, so let's take it up in, in uh, verse 26, uh, well, verse 25. Now the elder son was in the field, and when he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called the servant and asked what these things meant. And he said, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore his father came out, and entreated him. And he answering said unto his father, Lo, these many years I do serve thee, neither transgress I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou wouldst never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. And so, <clears throat> the, the, the son was not easily entreated. The, the father came to the son and said, Son, your brother's home. Come on in. We're rejoicing. And he's pleading with him and he's trying to, to get him to come in. But he's not easily entreated here, is he? He, he won't listen to, to what the truth of the matter is. So he says, uh, I never transgressed, but verse 30, but as soon as this thy son was come, which devoured Thy living with heart, harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. And it was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive, and was lost and is found. So we have the father entreating the older son. He's saying, Come on, son, look. And he's trying to, to urge him to come to the right conclusion. Uh, he's trying to persuade him to come in and rejoice. I mean, it is a thing to rejoice that the older son, uh, that the, 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 the younger son got right with the father and with right with God. Amen? And so he's trying to persuade him. He is entreating him. But he's not doing it. And a pastor, that's, that's my job. Uh, each Sunday I entreat you to try and follow the word of God. Amen. I preach unto you the word of God. And teach you the word of God. And uh, try to get you and say come this way. Come this way. Come this way. Be gentle. Come this way. Be pure. Come this way. And that's, that's my job. And you're to be easily entreated. You should have a tender heart and say. Okay God says I should be pure. Lord. Thank you. 
show, for showing me this. Help me to be that way. Easily entreated. It's not that the, the preacher should have to come uh, week after week and say, listen, this is what you need to be. And it's, it's a, and that's why a preacher, preacher is so important. Preach the truth. Preach the word. Be in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I, is, I, I, I don't need to preach patriotism. I need to preach the truth. I don't need to preach culture. I need to preach the truth, the word of God. And 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 each one of us have to have that attitude of easily being treated, entreated. And uh, I gave the example this morning. Well, when I first got saved, I thought, you know, uh, if you stop believing, you, you lose your salvation. But I was shown from the word of God that that's not so. Uh, it's wonderful to know that that uh, uh, I'm kept by the power of God, and uh, I, I'm His son. And uh, the Bible says, if I deny Him, He cannot deny me, because Christ lives in me. And I, I told the story of a, a lo lovely couple, but they were so set in their way they wouldn't forsake false doctrine. And uh, I would sit with them with the Word of God, and I would show them, okay, God says we are in His hand. And no man can pluck them out of his our, his hand. So does no no man mean me? Yes, I can't pluck them. Am I saved by grace? Yes. Am I kept by grace? Yes. And they would show them that eternal life is a gift, and you don't work to keep it. And they would see this. But then after two weeks, they'd go back and say, "Well, if I don't live good enough, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna lose my salvation." And you know what? They weren't easily entreated. They were set in their way and they said, I will not conform to what the Bible says. It's not that they didn't see it. They saw it and they said, I'm going to stay where I'm at. And that happens so many in uh, Christians' lives. You know, uh, I remember when I uh, first heard, you know, about... Uh, Going to the to the uh, well, I lived in Bermuda, and, and I never thought anything of of, of uh, immodesty. Like you go to the beach, but you have no clothes. You're, you're literally oh, the men and women are almost naked, and I never thought anything about it. But I, when I first time I heard a preacher say that's not modest, I thought, oh, that's just okay. And then the more I thought about it, you know, he's right. That's wrong. It's, if it's if, it, if if God says that men and women should dress modestly, I have to be easily entreated and say, "Okay, God, I'm going to do it." What about? Yes, it's culture today says that's perfectly fine, doesn't it? I remember the first time hearing about rock music, how it was not good. Well, I loved my rock music, but I had to be entreated to go the right way. You see, I'm. I shouldn't be stubborn or obstinate. I shouldn't fight against the truth. As God shows me and reveals tr truth to me, I need to be easily entreated. But it's got to be God's word. Amen? Uh, if, if somebody comes and teaches something not con contrary to the word of God, don't follow it. If it's the word of God, follow it. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Here's an example of entreating. Philippians 4, verse 3. And you think, well, I, I'm sound doctrine. Do you know what? Even as a... Uh, um, like I've been preaching for many years, and, and I, I realized when, sitting under Dr. Strauss, something that I taught was not correct. But as soon as I saw it, you know what I had to say? Okay, I was wrong. I've been preaching for like 30 years. But I, I've got to have that tender heart still, amen? To be easily entreated. Now, obviously, it wasn't a major doctrine. Uh, but still, I have to have that tender heart to be tr easily entreated. Paul says in Philippians, he's talking to the church of Philippi. Philippians 4, verse 3, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, 
with Clement also, and with the, uh, my fellow, my other, with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. When when he says it, this kind of a funny way, with other my fellow laborers, it's kind of hard to, to, to we would generally say my other fellow laborers, wouldn't we? Uh, the word uh, is a little bit uh, different. But he says, I entreat thee. He says, come on, listen, this is what you need to do. These people are good, godly people doing the work of God. You look after them. And he's trying to persuade them gently that they would do it. And you know what? That's the, what they need to do. Because that's what we need to do. Uh, the Bible says, charity believeth all things. Charity is easily entreated. It says, okay, God said it. I believe it. I'm going to follow it. Okay, so let's continue on. James 3. Verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easily to be entreated, and then full of mercy. Uh, let me read you a definition of mercy. That benevolence, mindness, or tenderness of heart which disposes a person to overlook injuries or to treat an offender better than he deserves. The disposition that tempers justice and induces an injured person to forgive trespasses and injuries and to forbear punishment or inflict less than the law or justice will warrant. In this sense, there's perhaps no other word in our language precisely synonymous with mercy. That which comes nearest to it is grace. It implies benevolence, tenderness, mildness, pity or compassion and clemency, but exercised only toward offenders. <clears throat> Mercy is a distinguishing attribute of the supreme being. Mercy is this. Somebody's done me wrong, but I don't do anything back. I don't say something bad back. I don't do something bad back. That is what mercy is. And that's what God wants us. Deuteronomy 4 verse 31 says, For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. Merciful means what? Well, break it down. Merciful. Showing. Go ahead. Showing lots of mercy. Lots of mercy. Full of mercy. Amen. That's what I need to be. I need to be Christ-like. Psalm 86, verse 15. But thou, o Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. And you know why? If I need to show mercy to people, and that will make me uh, more Christ-like. Amen? doesn't mean I excuse sin. I, I always have to condemn sin. But I don't have to... Uh, um, the word's gone from my head. Just, uh, I condemn sin, but I don't, necess uh, don't hold it against the person. I, I, but I do still have to say sin is sin. Do you understand? Merciful does not say, oh, that's okay. It's not, it doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. It says it's wrong, but I, I'm going to forgive you and I'm not going to hold it against you. Do you understand what I mean? And uh, we have this uh, false, again, teaching today that, well, just don't, don't say, you're, you're merciful. Just don't call it sin. No, you have to call it sin. God calls sin, sin, doesn't he? But yet he is merciful. Again, Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. Understand this. Mercy is something that we actively do. And it's against, it, it is for people that have done things against us or others. So it's something that's actively done towards somebody that has hurt us or hurt somebody that we love. And we show mercy. It comes from a heart of love and desire to help others. That's God's heart, isn't it? Amen? That's what God's like. My, my showing mercy makes God attractive to others. They see mercy in my life 
and they say, oh, he's a Christian. That's, that's nice. That's what I need. Let me read you this quote. A man possessed of such a disposition is like a tree ever in bloom, ever bestowing its blessed fruits upon those about it. This, indeed, is the test of the heart's status. One cannot n always know the condition of the tree, but one can easily determine the character of the tree by the nature of the fruit. And so that's the next thing. It says fruits. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, uh, then peaceable, gentle, easily to be entreated. And what's the next thing? Full of mercy and good fruits. So I'm to be full of mercy and good fruits. In other words, I, I'm to be full of good works. That's the fruit of my life. Amen. That, that I bring honor and glory to God by my good works. Matthew tells us that in verse uh, chapter 5, verse 15. <coughs> <coughs> Let your light so shine before men <coughs> that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. My good works, my, my good fruit, the fruit of my life should bring God honor and glory <clears throat> I want you to turn your Bible and I want to show you something here second Timothy <clears throat> chapter 3 verse 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So God, <clears throat> God's given us his word to change us to be like him. Verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, that's morally complete, truly furnished unto all good works. God has everything in his word to make us complete in him I don't need any other revelation I don't need any other book it's all in his word and so I am to be full of good fruits well by following his word amen by living according to his word look at uh, <clears throat> Titus you turn to Titus and we uh, memorized Philippians 1, verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, under the glory and praise of God. All these things, as they, as they come in my life, bring honor and glory to God, and He creates the fruit of the Spirit in my life as I follow these. Now, Titus is an interesting book. I, I, it's a lovely little book. It's only three chapters, but there's so much in it. <clears throat> The Bible says in Titus 2.14, talking about Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. My good works will be fruit. And God said he, he redeemed me for that I would be zealous of good works. And what do the good works do? Tells us in Matthew, remember? What does it say? Let your light so shine. Keep going. Okay, well, just the end part. That, that you may glorify your Father which is in heaven. Why should I have good fruits? Because it will glorify God. That's what I'm here. I'm saved to bring God honor and glory and to serve Him. Titus 3, verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Uh, he says, I, I, I want you to, Titus, I want you to preach this a lot. This is very important. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly. What's affirm mean? reiterate and say this is the truth and how often is he supposed to do it constantly 
I don't know how often constantly is, but it's a lot of times, amen? We're, we're to be reminded constantly that they which have believed in God, that believers, and then it says, might be careful. Don't just do good works, but make sure you work hard at it. Amen? Why? Because these things are good and profitable unto men. This, this is for your benefit. And then finally in Titus 3.14, and let us also learn to main good, maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not, what? Titus 3.14, that they be not Unfruitful. unfruitful well what does it say that we're supposed to in, he, in in James again what does that say that kind of ties together doesn't it James 3 17 but the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable gentle easily being traded full of mercy and good what fruits our good works are fruitful amen isn't that what it says in Titus 3 14 and let us also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. <clears throat> my my, my uh, works are fruit unto God. The Bible says, uh, Galatians 6.10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of, of faith. I do good unto all men. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, James 3, 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easily to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality. Without partiality. No prejudice, for or against. Uh, my dad told me... Uh, when he went to uh, <clears throat> the States when I must have been seven or eight, so he was uh, probably, say, 1965. He went to the States and the guy invited him to church and, and, and he said, uh, we don't have any blacks in our church. And he was proud of it. That's partiality, isn't it? And... Uh, that's really terrible. And so many people are, are partial to, to somebody because their skin color, because of the language they speak, because of uh, the country they came, grew up in. I am no better than anybody else because I grew up in Canada. And I'm no worse than anybody else because I grew up in Canada. Amen? Without partiality. I, I shouldn't be partial in... in, in in judging anything or anyone, I should go by the word of God. Uh, Peter said in uh, Acts 10.34, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Now James talked about this earlier in James chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. So partiality would be respect of persons. This seems to be a problem uh, that James is dealing with here. <clears throat> For if there come unto your assembly a man with gold ring and goodly apparel, in goodly apparel, and there come in a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect unto him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here at a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit under my footstool, are you not then partial in yourselves and become judges of evil and of evil thoughts? Hearken, uh, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not blaspheme that, wor that worthy name by which you are all called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So their problem, they were partiality. And what were they partial about? What was it talking about? They were partial about 
looks rich person comes in nice clothes has lots of money this guy is poor he's got nothing oh he's a good Christian let's oh man good to see you oh you can sit over there in the corner that's partiality today partiality is more to do with skin color than than uh, uh, I mean it's a big problem worldwide prejudice about skin color from the country that you came from because of the language you speak isn't that terrible that's unchrist like it's wicked it's vile and so it's it's wisdom that comes from the earth sensual and devilish and God says no I don't want that I want you to be without partiality. Uh, regardless of one's economic status, racial, racial origins, the Christian does not relate to one another, one another according to that. And you know, I, I think it's really sad. I think it's really sad. You have churches. Oh, this is an Indian church. Oh, this is a Filipino church. This is a Nigerian church. Is that from God? That's partiality according to skin color language and I appreciate you know everybody that comes here uh, because we come because we have the word of God amen and so uh, <clears throat> lots of people go to church because of the skin color of, of the people in the church with them and I told you this before but I went to a church and I was the only white person in the congregation uh, I thought nothing of it. Why? Because they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? And they thought nothing of it. They, uh, they, it never came up. Uh, and and you know what? That's right. Because they were without partiality. They didn't say, okay, you're, you're the white fella. You sit back there and all, all of us can sit up here. That would have been horrible, wouldn't it? And then finally without hypocrisy. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. <clears throat> James talked about this earlier in, in, in chapter 1, verse 22. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. That's what a hypocrite does. They deceive themselves. They think they're, uh, they, they think they're something that they're not. Uh, Romans says this, uh, Romans 12, verse 9, Let your love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Dissimulation is to hide or disguise one's feelings. Well, that's a hypocrite, isn't it? Oh, oh I love you, my brother, and, and then talk about them behind their back. That, that would be hypocritical, wouldn't it? Say one thing and do another. Let me read you this. A hypocrite is therefore one who practices deception. One who appears to be other than what they really is. They should be are, but anyways. Hypocrisy was exceedingly common among the Jews. And our Lord's more severe, severe denunciations were leveled against them because of this sin. And so, uh, we just... Uh, Go to Matthew, and, and uh, we're going to look at this. And look at what Jesus says about hypocrisy. First of all, <clears throat> Matthew <clears throat> chapter 23. Verses 1 to 5. Jesus is talking about the uh, scribes and the Pharisees. I'll start in verse 2. Saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, ob and that observe and do. But do not after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen of men. 
They make broad the phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the uttermost part rooms and the feasts and the chiefs and the synagogues, and the greetings and the markets. And so they were they were uh, 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 hypocrites. They said one thing and they did another. And these were religious people, scribes and Pharisees. What does the word Pharisee mean? What what did they believe? We we think today when when we say Pharisee, it all mean already automatically we think hypocrite, right? But it means to be separate. They they thought they were going to separate from everything. And so look, continue down verse thirteen. But woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! Uh, verse fourteen. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! Verse fifteen. Woe to you, uh, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! Uh, Jesus gives them a scathing rebuke. Verse 23. Woe are you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And uh, we'll just look at that. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done and not leave the other undone. He said, okay, you're very careful. You tithe of everything you've got. He says, these you ought to have done. But what did they not do? They didn't do the things that were import more important. Uh, judgment, mercy, and faith. Hypocrites. <clears throat> Verse 25. Woe are you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Uh, they're blind leaders. Verse 27. Woe are you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And... Uh, verse 29 warn you scribes pharisees hypocrites it's a it's a a, a terrible terrible uh, uh thing that they were doing they were pretending to be something that they weren't they they outwardly said okay i'm good i'm godly i'm religious but they weren't they did it all for a word starting with S. Self. Good word, self, but S H show. show. It was all outward show. And so we need to be very careful that that uh, our Christian life will be without hypocrisy. Amen. So I've covered an awful lot in this uh, sermon, uh, but I hope it will help and convict. Amen. My, uh, so, uh, somebody said if, if I, if I uh, preached and, and, and it didn't uh, convict you of anything I'm sorry about that <laughs> I meant to convict I want each one of us to be changed every Sunday I, I want God to say okay Lionel Smith that's not right in your life get it right I want that for each one of us that we will be closer and closer to God and that's what God wants from us so what, I, what do I want? I want the wisdom that's from above, that's pure and peaceable. That's what I want God to make in my life. That's easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So praise the Lord for that. Let's close in a word of prayer.